Cleaner ants, as their name would hopefully suggest, are a number of species of sarinid ants, not always closely related to one another, which have adapted to feed partially or entirely on the dead tissue and ectoparasites of larger animals, mainly birds. Their evolutionary origins surely come from the behavior of many birds known as anting, Whereas anting in its primitive form involves the use of ants merely as tools for the bird in question, and usually results in the harming or killing of many ants by the end of the process, the symbiosis adopted by cleaner ants and their patrons is a mutually beneficial affair. Depending on the species, cleaner ants may construct their nests on the ground or in tree hollows but in both instances are usually easily discovered if you know what to look for, for they are almost always surrounded by groups of small birds queuing up for their turn to be looked over by the workers. To avoid being eaten, as well as to immediately identify their intent, they are colored brightly in unmistakable patterns of black, red, and yellow. Their markings are not bluff either, for they carry potent stings and will utilize them readily if the colony feels threatened. To demonstrate their willingness to be cleaned and lack of ill intent, a bird thus must also provide a special signal before the ants will let down their guard. It will lean over to one side, point its bill skyward, showing that it has no interest in a meal, and raise a wing high over its head, allowing the insects to crawl up into its plumage. The ants then crawl through its feathers, searching for blood-sucking mites, dead skin cells, and anything else edible that they can grab in their jaws and take back to the colony, while their partner waits patiently as the ants cleanse its troubles away, eventually turning to the other side to allow its cleaners to reach every part of the body. When the process is complete, the bird's skin will be exfoliated, any small wounds will be cleaned and disinfected of septic tissue, and most of its blood-sucking parasites will have been removed. As an added bonus, the waiting birds are also sure to leave plenty of droppings near the colony, which the generalist ants will also pick through for additional edible pieces such as seeds that may have passed through the bird's stomachs intact. A dentant has thus been formed between the two natural enemies, each of which could harm its partner, but has more to gain by getting along. Some cleaner ants have interestingly lost their ability to fly entirely, with small vestigial wings, even as sexually fertile adults. Instead, they rely on birds to disperse and form new colonies. Grabbing a hold onto a feather or the scales of its leg, newly emerged fertile queens and drones stay with the bird for as long as a week before dropping off, sometimes many miles from their nest site. Knowing instinctively that wherever they are dropped off is likely a favorable spot for birds to rest and has a high chance of being visited by more birds again in the future. They will form a new colony right nearby and start the cycle anew. Cleaning behavior has evolved multiple times in ants upon Serena. Another group, only very distantly related to the colonial cleaner, specializes entirely in much larger animals. These ants are no longer social and belong to the group of flying, wasp-like predators known as vespers. Like the cleaner finches, they follow herds of large herbivores and feed mainly upon the large, blood-sucking tick mites that plague them, without harming the birds themselves. While docile if unprovoked, except towards the small parasites upon which they feed. 
They do retain a painful sting as a defense against smaller flying birds. They exhibit a novel method of rearing their offspring, which is also shared by some other flying ants. They carry their single larva in their middle pair of legs and raise it right there, rather than at a nest site, feeding it portions of every mite it subdues. The avian blood contained within is particularly nutritious for the developing young. To make up for their small brood size, young grow quickly, and females are long enough lived to be able to rear a new larvae every three weeks for as long as two years. 100 million years post-establishment, Serena is now a world of rich and diverse ecosystems, home to a cast of characters both familiar and highly alien. Some creatures have changed remarkably little, if at all, over many hundreds of thousands of generations. Many invertebrates such as earthworms, ants, and snails still remain virtually identical to their ancestors. Serena's freshwater streams still teem with drably colored, live-bearing fishes which could still pass for the wild poecilids of the Holocene, which gave rise to all of Serena's modern aquatic diversity. And even many seed-eating birds are scarcely changed fundamentally from the ancestral canary, except perhaps in their color. But that is not to say that nothing has changed. The land still teems with birdsong and the buzzing of crickets, but now there are forests in addition to Serena's primordial prairies. The descendants of small wild sunflowers and thicket-forming bamboo, they have spread across the world, growing taller and increasingly woody, filling what began as an ecological vacuum wherever rainfall allowed their growth. Browsers quickly evolved alongside to reach their heights to feed, small flighted birds transforming over the eons into enormous megafauna, larger than anything before them of their kind. To defend against them, as well as their own plant competitors, some trees adopted armed artillery, defensive ant colonies which lived symbiotically within their tissues. For a time, these myrmecophyte plants the descendants of bamboo, spread and dominated the planet. Made unpalatable to herbivores by the stings of their symbiotic partners and the space around them kept trimmed of any competitor's branches, they experienced a boom in diversity and greatly outnumbered their competitors by the end of the Tempocene, 50 million years ago. By the Middle Thermocene, these trees have become the dominant floral group across the planet, but success has come at a price. Life is an arms race with very few true winners or losers. Animals formerly unable to feed on myrmecophyte trees eventually developed immunity to the venom of the insects, or simply developed longer beaks and tissues defended by skin too thick to be easily pierced by their attacks, so that they could still feed on the plant's foliage. Additionally, the enormous increase in ant numbers resulting from the myrmecophyte explosion of the Tempocene was soon curbed by the appearance of highly successful animal lineages specialized specifically to consume ants. Soon, Ants could not afford to be as bold and aggressive as they once could, lest they be rapidly seen, eaten, and their colonies eventually subject to collapse. On the floral front, some competing plant groups developed sticky protective coatings to guard their new growth against ants coming to prune them, catching the insects or gluing together their jaws 
so that they could cause no damage. Once the stem was older and less vulnerable, it ceased to produce the substances. Others filled their sap with a thick latex to serve a similar function, covering the ants in a noxious glue as soon as they took a bite and broke the plant's tissues. Some sunflower trees also evolved, which turned their competitors' armies against them. They began to host their own ants, producing their own enticing nectar or other food reserves and lodging in the form of hollows in their trunks, branches, or leaves, in return for protection against competing trees. At the Thermocene, Remechophyte trees remain the dominant floral group, though many others utilize sticky defensive sap or other adaptations to defend themselves instead. But these relationships are no longer groundbreaking simply because they have become so common. If every tree has ants to protect it, and herbivores have learned to deal with the ants' defenses, then effectively all of the adaptation is doing little overall to help any one individual ant or tree's survival compared to a forest where such symbiosis is totally absent. But the system has become so complex that in most cases, the relationship cannot simply dissolve. For because it has become so successful, any tree which stops providing for its partners, at least without developing an entirely new line of defense, will be the first to succumb when the ants living on the other trees or the browsing animals realize it lacks any defenses. This is why the relationship survives. Ants continue to guard their host trees as best they can without giving themselves away excessively to hungry ant-eating predators, whilst both the browsing animals and the trees simultaneously continue to develop new ways of protecting themselves and circumventing the ant's defenses. When an herbivore begins to feed on a bamboo tree, the ants on that tree will release pheromones, telling all of the ants living on trees downwind that a threat is approaching and to be on guard. All that a browser such as a serolope must then learn to do, however, is feed whilst moving upwind, and it then will not alert the guardians of its food supply if it only spends a short time at each branch. It is so that life continues to be a battle among countless warriors with no end in sight. In the end, it may seem that all of the adaptation has become almost pointless, but in even the bigger scheme of things, isn't all life in the end? Unless or until some new, groundbreaking adaptation appears to move the competitive arms race back into the fast lane, something akin to the appearance of flowering plants on Earth, or the original adaptation of ant symbiosis on a young Serena, it can be expected that Serena's forest communities, which had already reached this relatively stable state by the Cryocene, may remain relatively the same as they have been for many more millennia to come. Such stable conditions, so long as they last, will be beneficial for the continued survival of modern plant and animal groups, but will slow the appearance of new lineages in comparison to a younger Serena, which was a much more unstable environment, where rapid change and new speciation was the recipe for survival. Serena will remain more volcanic throughout the Thermocene than ever before, and will maintain its greenhouse climate and widespread tropical conditions for the next 75 million years.